get out of the community and, and mark it. And you, you show them that this is a paused marketing program. And then we show that agent how to invite ideally 50 like minded companies to become in their base as members of the kind of who are sponsored by that agent. These companies get information from us thanks to our community champion regularly, which includes everything from posters to training materials to notification of events, opportunities to recognize their employees, whatever. So we mobilize the community thanks to our community champion. And then these companies have employees and friends and family and their customers. And it's a tool they have teachers and they have parents which is to become friends of the Tiger Federation. And we also create social media access for, for our community champions, encouraging good faith to follow and we post on their if they have a business Facebook page, we post what we call kind of daily. If we don't, we set up a post form and we post what they have. So the secret, the, the opportunity that we've got when we, we generate the following of friends of the Tiny Federation who are glad to be getting information from the members of the Tiny Federation, which is sponsored by the community champion. And, and, and literally, thanks to this collaboration, we've been adding our footprint. We're, we're from Tampa, Florida, to Connecticut, to California, and everywhere in between. We're not going anywhere. Uh, so we're delighted with, with, with the footprint and the impact that we're making in this community. Now, the key element here is the simple fact that in today's world, it's time to shine. Uh, we like to tell the story that, that I'm a business person, and we, we love pay it forward, we love uh, random acts of kindness, we love all of that, but that's not what we're all about. We're a business-oriented operation. We feel like, and, and I'm going to share with you some surveys that validate we treat our employees with dignity and respect and courtesy and kindness. They're going to stay with us because we don't get that treatment by the If they, if we treat them and make them contented, and I'll use an analogy here in a minute, they're going to stay with us. They're going to be loyal. And they're going to track a certain type of stuff. And one good example of this, go to Chick-fil-A. Now, I know Chick-fil-A is having a little controversy, and we're talking about belief systems there. But when it comes to customer service, it doesn't get any better. Treat everybody the same. It's not coincidental customer service. It's branded. These people are trained to create, to create a great atmosphere. If you go to a Chick-fil-A, go and eat a Chick-fil-A. Watch the people who own the, the operation because they will be there. Watch the people who are working there. Watch the people who are eating. Just observe them. 15 minutes. Go down the street. Go to a competitor. I won't mention the name of the competitor. Watch the many people who are in there. <laughs> <laughs> see if you see a difference, and you will. You will, because there is an attraction based on that culture, which is based on value. Now, here's the important thing for us to remember when we're talking about kindness in business. Um, the key to kindness in business is not an attitude, it's a behavior. And that's, that's the most significant thing that we our business uh, part. We can't manage attitudes. Okay, as a manager or supervisor, I cannot manage your attitude. Because you can tell me you're happy and I got a buy. But I can't manage how you behave. Just behave like you care. Just behave like you do the same. Just behave like you care about your job. I don't care whether you do or not. I had a presentation I made to a car dealer uh, a few weeks ago and we were talking about this difference. Attitude. And I said, when your customer throws off the lot, you wave them at them like that. They don't care if you're thinking, I hope that SOP never comes back. <laughs> okay? Because they're not going to spend any bandwidth thinking about it. They just think, oh, I'm important and I care. And you can just stand there and go, man, I hope you never think that. <laughs> but you act like you care about it. And that's going to make them more trouble. Because in today's uh, uh, business society, we have options. 
we have choices we can make. And, 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 and as a consumer advocate, I can tell you that people are doing business with you because of you. They're not doing business because of, because of what you do, because we have options to get what you do, regardless of what it is. I, I want to wonder if you do That's about the only company that we're just, we're locked into. I don't care whether it's send out cards, I don't care whether it's fashion, I don't care whether it's consulting, I don't care whether it's telecom, I don't care whether it's travel, I don't care whether it's insurance, I don't care what it is. Retail, shopping, whatever, we got options. So what's going to cause me to drive past those other options to do business with you? You is the way I'm treated. You make me feel important, make me feel special. I'm going to go out of the way to do it. So, kindness in business. We, we, uh, we as kind of revolution like to do surveys. And we have done surveys on this constantly. Um, and, and I know I've just got a couple of minutes left. The number one reason that you will lose a customer and they'll never come back is due to an attitude of indifference on the part of one employee in your organization. And that could be the person who answers the phone, it could be the person who delivers the stuff, or it could be you. But, but that interaction at the time with the consumer will be the reason that they will stay with you or not. Virginia said something that's important. There are three stages of customer service, and they don't bear. There's the first impression, there's engagement, and then there's the service. First impression today tends to be website. Okay? Used to be the elevator. People pick up, before they call you for service, they're going to check you out on the internet. That's human nature to us. So we need to look good with a great first impression. We need to sound good when the phone is answered. We need to look good if we're delivering service to a home. We need to look crisp and clean. And the second is the engagement. In other words, the communication, the dialogue. Once, I'm, once I've, you've made that first impression, then, then that engagement is important. And then finally, the quality of service is what most businesses focus on when it's the least thing that consumers are interested in. Marty, I expect that if, if I do travel with you, you guys are going to take me out. I expect you to a great job, by the way. But, but you see what I'm saying? I expect my teeth to be cleaned. I expect the car to be fixed. I expect the wireless to be corrected. But it's that engagement that makes the difference that causes me to say, I'm coming back. Uh, very quickly, 96.5% of consumers that we survey state that the, that the expression of value of a company is critical to their decision in the consumer world. In other words, I want to know not only what to do, but what's important. I want to know what they can do. 100% of consumers said they prefer to do business with a kind of company. 100% of employees said they prefer to be employed by a kind of company. 56.5% consider their employee to be either unkind or less than kind. Okay? So we want it, and we're not getting it. So kindness in business, we provide it. We let your customers know that they're going to get it. Let them set the expectation that kindness comes with the territory. Treat your employees with dignity, respect, courtesy, and kindness, and you're going to own it. Tom Peter says it's like bread breaking in an oven. You can sense it. There's an aroma when you walk into a tiny shop. You can sense it. You know it. And so the focus needs to be on the dignity and respect with which we treat our employees and expect that behavior to be passed down to our customers. So I'm out of time. Uh, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Before we go to our next speaker, I'd like us all to stand, grab a cup of coffee, and take a picture of
is an attorney, she's a mother, and I would say that the other part, which is you have your own floor, but you've got another floor or raised roof, yeah, that she's also raised. There, you know, most people think that if you put up free hippies, they should get a free floor. <laughs> <laughs> She is a certified LASHCO lawyer board member of Team Friends International, which is a nonprofit there that they uh, started for interfaith, interfaith Muslim Association, and they founded the Interfaith Dialogue uh, I mean, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, living with my mother's pain and heart is pain and pain. Okay, so she has been dead with the anonymity of the young woman. This is something that lost cognitive and motor abilities. So my children, in their good and highly intelligent bodies, that they went to the school for all of them, voted together to have her on the And so they. presentation this is executive school. <laughs> they took a night and reorganized the entire house to show how to be done. We didn't have a big enough house to have all of these things in the house. Let alone a bed that was big enough. And they did it. They showed me the mustache and the shape of the hand. I had a several years 
flower pot, covered the toilet seat, and put up <laughs> matches in this. <laughs> but they didn't see me. So I now have a mother with Alzheimer's and a new best friend. Now, I believe that I can very confidently talk to you about my personal journey on trying to learn about coping with stress. But added with this component that I think Ed World has helped me understand what I'm doing, I was also a business advisor and was really cool to practice in the same firm. And we had terrible situations representing, as plain as it can be, people who were losing their jobs. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the kindness revolution and what has happened with companies. It was a time when the thing companies were doing was what was Machiavellian, okay? And if you don't know what Machiavellian things are, it's very misunderstood. I'm not putting down any Machiavellian ideas. The end justifies the means, okay? Prior to this, folks like One Minute Manager and Money Isn't Everything had come out into the picture. 101 ways to reward employees because they were learning in those days, in the 90s, that uh, employee satisfaction, employee retention, and all that was necessary. As the culture of the time starts moving away, we get things like the Machiavellian ends justify the means, cut growth policies, get rid of employees. You know, my husband, Dan Lewis, who's a local employment and labor attorney, says his people have come to him because they've lost their jobs with discrimination is that the days of loyalty to a company being rewarded are over. The days of loyalty to a company being rewarded are over. The days of a company needing you to perform have been changed. They don't care. And what he tells them is, you've got to be in a company that's going to be rewarding you. Recently, for me, of a place where one of my relatives is very sick. She's a hardworking person, truly performing to the best of her ability, and um, she's got an employee about her. And one day, every one of them had it. I knew her name. She was poor. She didn't have a family. She hated it. And I was sick. Ed Horrell has said to me that he cannot. The kindness revolution is not what the company needs to do. See, I mean, attitude. 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 The kindness revolution is not what the employee needs to do. Attitude. But it is seeing people as behavior. I want you to do something for me about behavior. I want you to write down the new best regret. I want you to put your head down and show them regret. I think the most depressing thing you can possibly do. Get as depressed as you can. <laughs> Just move it, do it, do it, do it. Fine, Dad, this is interactive. Uh, there you go. Now I want you to say, I am so happy. I am I so, so happy. happy. Okay. Now, I want you to put your shoulders back. I want you to take a deep breath. Keep your arms up. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to put your shoulders back, raise your arms up high, because I am so depressed. I am so a lot harder to be depressed when you say you're happy than to say you're happy and say you're depressed. Why do we have emotions that have been wrong? What the world collapses will be easy to rebuild. It is a benefit, the therapeutic benefit of laughter as a physical, a physiological benefit that your body, your mind, and your spirit receive. We say at the World Laughing Tour that soap is the body, to the soul, as soap is to the body. Okay, laughter is to the soul, guys. This is right now. 
Laughter is to the soul, as soap is to the body. So when we laugh, we are cleansing ourselves of a lot of things. So what I bring to the table today, in conjunction with Ed Rose, amazing, most fantastic, uh, I have admired him for years and didn't know he was an idea. Uh, <laughs> the time is revolution. And what I bring to you today is the World Laughter Tour and Steve Wilson, who's a psychologist of over 30 years, who has created a program that not only brought the old concepts of yoga, laughter yoga from India, but westernized it into this culture, because in the 80s when he first brought it to this culture, he was concerned about the culture side of it. So I want you to look in your little brochure at the tavern, and the principles of therapeutic laughter are that it's non-political, non-religious, non-exploitive, non-perfectionistic, non-threatening, non-competitive, not a cult. Everyone's welcome. So what I'm going to teach you today are principles of therapeutic laughter combined with something that we call the DHL program, which is the Good Hearted Living Program. This is why I was invited here. So now that you know a little background about therapeutic laughter and good hearted living, I'm not going to go over the health benefits. We don't have time to go over the health benefits of laughter. We've got a brochure in front of you. I'm going to give you a five little second presentation of what your company, association, or organization could be doing if I created a laughter program. Okay? So let us begin now. Okay. Now, laughter is a form of exercise. It can be used in stomach function. If anybody here has hemorrhoids, <laughs> <laughs> or is pregnant, or, hey, <laughs> or, you know, a dish If you have any kind of abdominal surgery, you may want to take a moment and reflect on how hard it's been working. Um, if you've had any region illnesses, and if you have any food or anything that might possibly allow you to make you trip or whatever, please, please, you know, be careful in what we're doing. Because we are doing a combination of aerobic and anaerobic. What we do in the World Laboratory is we use both the right and the left side of our brain, and we are restructuring it so that we, in the long run, can prevent the hardening of the attitudes that occur when we grow up. So, adults have a tendency to be kind. Maybe less than 15 years ago. And some of the reason good laughter is toxic laughter. And we'll talk a little bit about toxic laughter. Let's do some yoga type breathing. Slowly breathe out. 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 And I want you to know that this wonderful <coughs> the 
know this side of it. I know you know, I'm a member of the Faculty of Psychology Association because of my experience with autism and autism. I know very much a lot about disabilities and this is a very big important part of the story. So we use this Nairobi thing. It isn't actually antithetical to our case, but I'm so happy we have these black. This is why we feel good to be in the audience when we don't have to We're going. Thank you. 